Hi guys, today's lesson is going to be on trend forecasting, reading the future of fashion. Now I'm going to refer to two different aspects of sort of trend study, um, trend forecasting and trend researching. Um, they're very similar, however, there are differences between the two. So when we refer to trend research, we are researching the trends that are already in existence. When we do trend forecasting, we are trying to predict what trends will become and occur in the future. Now, the best way to do this is to do trend research, which of course is to research, study, and understand the trends that are occurring right now. Um, but of course, when we are forecasting, we are doing a type of prediction. And this is very important for fashion designers to do because um, we create our collections in advance. Um, it takes time to design, to make. Uh, so when we have our clothing hitting the stores, we want those trends to be in full effect. Um, so we have to understand sort of what's going to happen in the future, how it's going to progress, and sort of gauge. So when we are designing, which might be um, a few months, one month, a year perhaps, before our clothing is going to hit the retail market, we must anticipate what trends are going to be popular at that specific time. And there's a number of ways that we can do that. First, let's understand how trends, ideas, or innovations are adopted by the um, population. Now, this image shows the diffusion curve or the innovation adoption curve. Um, it has lots of different names, but it is widely accepted and widely discussed amongst all sides of, types of marketers. It is a graph showing the widely accepted average curve of an idea or trend diffusion. Now the word diffusion means um, sort of adoption or the spreading out um, or proliferation of. So this is showing how an idea, innovation, or trend will become adopted and move through society. At first, only a few people will adopt a trend, and even fewer will initiate new ideas and innovations. If that trend is destined to catch on, it then quickly becomes adopted by the majority of the population here, which is represented by the large hump. However, as things change, um, all the trends and ideas will eventually fade away from the population, unless it becomes a tradition. But typically these are, when we're talking about fashion, um, trends, fads, things like that, that are adopted and then pass through the population and come out just as they um, came in in the first place. Now, this is a widely used model. Um, it's in any sort of marketing class or economics class, it is seen. Um, it was first presented by a man named Everett Rogers, who is a professor of communication uh, studies in his book, Diffusion of Innovation, which was first published in 1962. Since then, as I said, it's become a very accepted model of how ideas or trends spread through the population. We're going to take a little bit of a closer look at each segment of this curve. We're going to start with the innovators. So innovators are where new ideas, creations, inventions, and trends begin. They come up with original innovations either for their own personal lives or with the intent of trying to spread their innovations to the broader public. We as fashion designers are the innovators. So we are trying to come up with new styles, uh, new ideas, new trends, new clothing that hopefully will become adopted by the majority of the population. So the traits we see in innovators are that they are creative, they are free thinkers, they are risk takers, they're typically highly learned or skilled in their areas of innovation. This doesn't necessarily mean they're highly learned or skilled in all areas. 
Um, so for instance, as a fashion designer, you should be highly skilled and learned in your area of fashion. Um, however, that might not relate to being an innovator of tech. Um, you don't have to be a coder to be a fashion designer, at least yet. Um, they're typically forward thinking and have an understanding of the direction of uh, current trends will go. So they have this ability to do this trend research that we're talking about now um, and analyze it and come up uh, with solutions that will be viable in the future. Next are our early adopters. So the early adopters are people who are among the first people to adhere to a new idea, use a new technology, or wear a new fashion trend. They will be closest to a company's target customer, um, especially um, early adopters that we as fashion designers are interested in. So early adopters are a very, very important segment of this curve uh, for trend forecasters, trend researchers, and designers alike. They are the early indicators of new ideas. Um, they are the most likely to adhere or adopt to new things presented within a market. So when we do sample sales, which we'll talk about a little bit later um, for a designer, we want the early adopters to come to our sample sales. Uh, we want the input of early adopters to help us decide uh, what we should do for new collections. Early adopters often influence those around them. They are very important to companies interested in trend research, as I was just mentioning. Uh, they tend to be experimental, and they also tend to be young in age. And as we sort of move through the diffusion curve, we'll see a sort of aging of the cohorts in each section. So um, a lot of the attributes of early adopters tend to be reflected in younger aged people. Younger aged people are ten, uh, tend to be more experimental tend to be willing to take risks, um, and tend to be sort of influencing those around you as we are um, tend to be a very youth-oriented culture. So the youth tend to be the one that brings new ideas, uh, new technologies, uh, new innovations to the forefront. Uh, they feel very comfortable testing them out for the rest of their cohorts. Now I want to take a little bit of a break from um, looking at each of the sections and stop at the sort of gap between our early adopters and our majority adopters. Now what I did not mention in the first is, you know, every product or innovation um, desires to go through the entire innovation curve. However, that is not what happens. In fact, most fizzle out somewhere in the early adoption stage. Um, it would be great if everything we brought to the market really took off and was a wild success and was adopted uh, widespread. However, this does not happen. And what we as designers, marketers, anybody would like to do is understand how to bridge the gap between early adopters and that early majority. And this is sort of a little cartoon that is humorously looking at, uh, you know, the sort of mentalities of everyone in each section of the diffusion curve, and also this chasm here between our early adopters and the early majority. Um, it is important for us to bridge this gap because the majority of uh, money uh, being made off a design or idea or product comes when it becomes uh, uh, arrives when it becomes adopted by the majority stage. As you can see, majority is just what it um, uh, uh, seems like. It's the most amount of people. So if you have the most amount of people um, adopting, purchasing, adhering to your ideas, um, you'll make the most amount of money. Um, of course, we need to sort of cater down here because this is an important bridge. If we don't have our early adopters, we typically don't make the bridge to our majority. But our focus is really bridging this gap, um, creating a nice, easy transli 
transition from our early adopters to our early majority, which of course is very important for the um, financial success of our products. So how do we ensure that a trend or idea is going to make it from the early adoption stage to the majority? Well, nothing is set in so stone, but there are some factors that can affect whether uh, the majority will adopt a new innovation. And they include the perceived advantages of the innovation. So if this innovation um, has great, wildly uh, um, beneficial advantages that can offer the population something that will make life so much easier, um, that will benefit them greatly, um, they are much more likely to adopt the innovation. So this can be seen in fashion um, by maybe a different material. So when we saw something like spandex uh, being introduced into the market, it was very well received, obviously, because there's a lot of advantages to adding a little bit of spandex. It makes your clothing more comfortable. It makes it fit better. Um, it looks nicer on the body. It can hug the body. So there's all these advantages to that new innovation. Um, and those ad advantages will entice the majority population to purchase or adhere to whatever product, innovation, or trend that you're trying to um, get to go through this curve. The next is difficulty in adopting the innovation. So if some things are too complex, or too expensive, or um, just difficult to understand, um, this can create a barrier from it being adopted by the early majority. We like things that are easy to use, easy to access, um, things like that. That will ease its transition into the majority section. Then there's also risk in adopting the innovation. So if a, a very specifically a new trend is very, very out there, what is the risk in adopting it. So if it's a very risky trend, we could see someone adopting a trend that is very unlike the normal. What is the risk in their life? Well, there could be small risks or it could be large risks. If it's a specific trend um, in fashion, they could uh, potentially experience social isolation. Um, they could experience pressure on a job if they decide to wear a new trend at work. Um, that could potentially it, uh, affect their success in the workplace or their effectuality in the workplace. And it could also um, create risks amongst their social group as well. So um, trying to step out there too far and too risky a trend, trying to mix it up too differently, um, making such a drastic jump in one direction has a lot of risk in it. Um, however, if we reduce that risk, it again uh, creates this bridge between the early adoption stage and the majority adoption stage. Um, when people receive, uh, perceive things as low risk, they're much more likely to adopt it. So uh, again, in fashion, most of our risk comes from how um, other people will perceive us when we adopt a new trend. Uh, we want people to think of us as stylish, but perhaps this trend is so out there that we run the risk of looking silly or not looking professional or just simply looking ridiculous. Um, so again, it depends on how far we go in what direction and the risk perceived in uh, taking that new trend and adopting it. And this also goes very closely with our last factor, which um, is compatibility with the existing trends in life. Um, typically, if a new trend or innovation is very similar or very compatible with what already exists, it will go hand in hand in a sort of low risk situation. So again, when our trends or our innovations or ideas are already compatible with existing trends and ideas of life or generally held uh, popular belief uh, or opinions, 
they will very easily go from the early adopter stage into the early majority and late majority stages. Majority adoption. So this is what we all um, strive to achieve with our new inventions, ideas, or trends. And if a trend, an idea, or an uh, if a trend, idea, or invention can cross the gap from early adopters into the majority, it has quote unquote made it. It has gone viral or caught on, and will continue through the rest of the diffusion curve. This is where the most amount of money will be made off of the innovation. Early and late majority groups are very similar, but have some differences. So our early majority are somewhat risk adverse. Uh, our late majority are very risk adverse. Again, just sort of progressing these factors as we go. Um, the early, early majority wants to be on the cutting edge of things, but will wait longer in order to assess the benefits or risks of a new innovation. Um, the late majority tend to be much more skeptical of new things and will wait even longer um, until almost new changes, innovations, or ideas are kind of sort of forced on them by peer pressure and popular opinion. Early majority um, people have contact with early adopters. Um, late majority people have little contact with early adopters. Early majority people have average social standing, and late majority have average to low social standing. Early majority people have more money to spend, so they um, are easier able to sort of buy these new products and try them out. Late majority people have a little less money. They might wait um, for things to go on sale. Um, um, it's, if you're talking about technology, they may purchase uh, not the latest generation of technology, but something a little bit earlier to get a bit of a discount, simply because they're more free frugal or simply have less money to spend on these new trends, innovations, ideas, things like that. Also, to sort of go on, so our early adopters tend to be quite young. What we'll see too is we'll see um, the aging of the population through these uh, diffusion curves as well. So our early majority tends to be a little bit older um, uh, than our early adopters, but of course younger than our late majority. At the tail end of our diffusion curve, we have the laggards. Uh, the laggards are the last in the population to adopt a new product, trend, or, in trend or innovation. They represent the beginning of the end for a trend. Once a trend has been adopted by laggards, it will soon no longer be relevant. Traits that we can see in laggards are they are very risk averse and skeptical. They are not willing to take chances at all. They are stubborn and resistant to change. They value traditional views or methods. So when we talk about sort of traditional elements, these are things that stay true throughout much longer times. They do not sort of go in and out of the diffusion curve or the population uh, like trends or ideas. They will pretty much stay constant. Um, and our laggards tend to adhere to more quote unquote traditional views, methods, practices, or ideas more than things that come in and out of culture and society um, in these sort of fluctuations. They tend to be a little bit more loners and have less connection to others. And of course, they also tend to be older in age. And they, of course, sometimes may never adopt a certain idea, trend, or innovation. If we look at sort of the oldest um, people in our population, they have a very difficult time coming up with, you know, um, adopting specifically new technology, integrating with it, utilizing it. Um, and when you get to the very older spectrum, they might not ever tend to adopt a new um, product or trend or technology. For example, my 97-year-old grandma, she does not have a computer, she does not have a smartphone, nor will she ever. Um, she's a very good representative of the laggard community when it comes to tech. However, it's very interesting to sort of uh, look at some of the parallels between laggards and um, early adopters and innovators, though, as well. Although they represent two sides of the spectrum, um, 
these are virtues of the laggards that make them very different from our early adopters or innovators. But in the same way, our laggards are tend to be free thinkers. So they are not looking to society to tell them what to do. They're not looking to the broader population um, to try to dictate what they do to their lot with their lives, which is a very common trait amongst our early adopters and our especially our innovators. So our innovators again are free thinkers and are quite creative. Um, same here, uh, because of course laggards will not adhere to anything just because it's popular. Um, so it's interesting to sort of see those parallels um, uh, at the beginning and end of the spectrum as well. So that's very uh, an important thing to sort of understand when we're looking at our trends. Um, it's you know you can find a lot more about the diffusion curve um, the uh, uh, online if you want to get into it. Um, like I said, it's it's pretty much you know marketing 101. Everyone's got a quick little video or you know um, some uh, edutainment uh, clips on it. Um, and so if you want to learn more about the diffusion curve, of course, you can read uh, Everett Rogers' book, of course. Um, another excellent book that talks a lot about the diffusion of innovation is called The Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell, um, which looks at how trends become adopted by society. It takes a real deep dive into each one of these cohorts, especially early adopters, um, how companies specifically try to get in touch with their early adopters and market to them and how it can uh, how it is and is not sometimes successful in um, translating over to the majority with some very interesting case studies um, especially specifically fashion design case studies I really recommend um, both of these books for anybody but really specifically if you're looking for a very um, entertaining read uh, the Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell um, is, is just a great read, uh, very, very informational, very, very smart man, um, and very, very relevant um, to us as fashion designers who are interested in trends, interested in, in ideas catching on, and sort of keeping our finger on the pulse of uh, popular culture and how it fluctuates and changes constantly. All right. So again, I just sort of want to start, start off with this idea of how trends work and how they flow through society. Now let's move on to look at some of the types of trends um, and how we sort of categorize trends um, that we research. And we'll typically um, lump different trends into different categories. Now the main sort of categories, and we'll see different types of breakdowns um, all over. Everyone has their own way of sort of breaking down trends and influences. Sometimes it's just in two sections, macro and micro, but we're gonna do it in three sections, macro, mainstream, and micro. So um, just very generally, when researching trends, designers and analysts will try to investigate different levels of trends. Macro trends are geographically widespread, long-term, whereas the micro trends are the opposite. Mainstream trends are somewhere in the middle. Although m macro, mainstream, and micro trends may all vary, um, only a combination of all of them will truly represent the major influences affecting a customer. Designers must learn to incorporate all three types of trends into their trend forecasting. Now, even though we are sort of developing a sort of amalgamation of all these different trends and looking to different areas and sources for each one, um, again, like I said, they will all affect um, a designer's design, say, for the upcoming collection. But when we look at it, well, obviously the macro trends are going to be affecting collections, many co different collections, uh, probably for years to come. Uh, our mainstream will affect collections maybe for another year or two. Um, and our micro may only affect a single season. Um, so how we, um, really it's the length of time and how important to each market it will be. As we move to, as for designing for a more generalized market, 
um, our macro factors will be more important. If we're designing for a much more niche, specialized, almost counterculture uh, market, our micros will be much more important. So it depends on your market which factors you're going to weigh more heavily. But let's take a little bit of a cl more close look at each one of these factors and understand what they are. First, let's talk about our macro trends. As mentioned before, macro trends are factors that are widespread and are affecting many people at once over a long period of time. These trends will be influenced will influence design trends over a similarly long period of time. Examples of macro trends are political uh, politics, environmental trends, societal trends, technology trends, and economic trends. So. As uh, we see shifts in any one of these categories, the effects tend to be slow but long-lasting. And um, to be very specific, if I were to mention some macro trends available today, um, we can see obviously with the environment, climate change is a very good example of a macro trend. This is something that's going to be affecting people's lives for a long period to come, and it affects people all over the globe. Uh, not in isolated areas. And we'll be able to see different effects of uh, this trend in fashion for a very long time. So there's a push to make clothing much more sustainable, um, to use materials that are recycled and less uh, um, polluting toward uh, uh, the environment. And we'll see more and more um, pushes towards that from consumers um, as we move along, and that's going to be for a long time. In politics, we can see, you know, major macro trends. I would say um, in America, uh, division is our macro political trends. Um, we've seen this over many years, and we'll probably see it, unfortunately, over many years to come, is the growing divide between partisan politics. Um, and it's influenced society and also politics quite a bit. Um, this growing apart from our two uh, political parties. It's become very divisive, um, very, very um, combative, um, and so we can see that as a macro trend. Um, in society as a whole, um, I hate to say it, but COVID, of course, um, this is going to be, unfortunately, again, um, what's looking like a rather long-term um, factor that is going to affect, of course, everyone around the globe um, for, um, un uh, unfortunately, a long period of time. Um, and even when it is over, quote unquote, maybe when we have a vaccine, the effects of it are going to be felt um, in, you know, it's not going to simply just go away. It, it will have echoes um, and influences even after it's gone. So it's a good ex example of a macro trend. When we talk about macro trends for fashion, it might be a little bit more specifically based to fashion. So, oh, the color red is going to be in for many years, or we see this certain type of print mixing is going to be in for a uh, certain amount of many years. So many, um, as we get into uh, where we get our trends, many trend forecasters, when they talk about macro trends, they'll talk a little bit more specifically toward visual aesthetic uh, and design elements, but they certainly will not shy away from these more kind of conceptual macro trends that affect culture um, um, globally uh, over a long period of time. Because of course, fashion is simply a representation of who we are today. And since we are affected by all of these things, um, whether consciously or subconsciously, they will affect how we dress, how we style, um, and how we want to present to the world. Um, so again, this is a little bit more of our macro trends. Moving on, let's take a look at our, my, our mainstream trends. So mainstream trends are popular and will affect medium-sized segments of the population over a shorter amount of time than our macros. Um, ma mainstream uh, trends can be seen in the following. It's basically popular culture, mass media, 
public opinion. When we talk about the mainstream, we all sort of have an idea of what that means. It's sort of the generally accepted, um, generally presented, um, and again, it's not quite as long, uh, long, uh, long term as our macro, and not quite as widespread. Um, there may be mainstream trends within different subsets of the population, depending on what market. Um, typically, every market will have its own mainstream trends. Um, same if you look at music or art or media or different things like that. Different sections will have their own mainstream trends that aren't quite so overarching that they affect absolutely everyone in the population. I chose this because it sort of shows your kind of quote unquote mainstream imagery or fashion trends for a specific decade. It's kind of neat. I do have a little little things to nitpick. And it's very we'll go on a little bit of a tangent. He did a great job. I really, it's a really fun um, sort of uh, little collage of different time frames. But this tie is way too wide for the 60s. I'm going to be a nitpick. Ties are very, very narrow for men in the, in the 60s and almost rectangular without the points at the bottom. Very, very thin. Very, very thin. And he probably wouldn't be wearing a jean jacket. Maybe a jean jacket, but a nice little mod, clean suit. Again, very slim fit. Uh, would be more appropriate. For the 70s here, this lapel is way too narrow. In the 70s lapels and even collars got way wide for the suits. Um, so I'm going to nitpick right there. Otherwise, it's looking quite good. And of course, you know, he's probably doesn't have period pieces. So that's why you're seeing a little bit of these inaccuracies. Um, he's probably just picking something out of his wardrobe that looks appropriate. Um, similar to the 50s, we're not going to see this style of graphic tee quite yet. Just a plain white t-shirt would have been much more appropriate. Anywho, tangent done. Let's move on to micro trends. So micro trends are factors that will influence small groups of people over a short amount of time. They tend to be hyper localized and have an immediate impact on those uh, um, customers that they would be relevant to. Micro trends might include seasonal changes, um, isolated fads, uh, trends that have a smaller quote unquote cult following, or trends within niche markets. So again, if you're working in a very niche uh, market, um, one with a very specific, um, almost subculture-esque uh, group or, or customer, your micro trends are going to be much more important. And um, they might change a lot more quickly than our macro or mainstream trends. They might be here and then gone. Um, and they might be associated too with um, different sort of blips in cultural population. So if it's not associated maybe with a niche market, it's associated maybe more with a mainstream population, but it just is very short. So it might just be, a, you know, a super popular viral video that's, you know, popular for a month or two and then goes away. Um, same thing maybe with a, a you know, the, the most watched show on Netflix or Amazon or, or whatever, Hulu, that's very, very popular everyone binge watch it and then it's out of the zeitgeist in a month or two. Um, so these are our micro trends, things that sort of happen in short blasts. And they're very hard to predict, um, again, because they are so temporal, so short-lived. Um, it's hard to know when they will pop up. Um, and for a designer, if you do want to take advantage of micro trends, um, you have to have a be very hypersensitive to when uh, they first occur and uh, respond very, very quickly, incorporate, and then uh, produce them into your product very, very quickly. Um, because again, no one wants to uh, have a micro trend that was popular six months ago pop up in their collection six months later. It makes them look very dated. Um, stale, out of touch. So it can be very effective when designers can incorporate um, and uh, very quickly and take advantage of these micro trends, you know, almost immediately. Um, and it becomes faster and faster these days because um, in, with the internet and everything else, 
information trends are disseminating more quickly than ever, really, really quickly. Um, so designers have to be really ready on the pulse um, and be very efficient and streamlined in adapting these micro trends into their products or else it's not even worth doing it at all. So those are our types of trends. So where do we go to do our research and how do we conduct it? Well, there's a number of sources um, and methods that trend forecasters and designers use to try to get a, a finger on the pulse, so to speak. So let's look at some of them. First, we have celebrity influencers. So many celebrities serve as early adopters to new fashion trends. They can influence their fans and followers and so are a good source of trend research. Designers will study how a particular celebrity dresses if they are someone who their customer admires. Now this is very important. I can study, you know, different celebrities all day, but if my customer is not doing the same, it doesn't really matter. So I must ensure that my customer is doing the same thing, that they are looking to this celebrity, uh, looking at what they're wearing, and saying, hey, I want to do that. So they, these celebrities must be acting as early adopters um, that will bridge that gap, uh, or help you bridge that gap, into the majority adoption. Um, and that depends, again, on how closely your customer um, is admiring this celebrity, wants to be like them, is going to copy what they do, is going to be influenced by their choices of dress and behavior. Designers will research the following types of celebrities if they serve as a style icon to their customer. So we're gonna look at actors and actresses, musicians, social media influencers, athletes, artists, and other cultural icons. All of them can serve as style icons to a broader customer base. Competition research. The competition refers to any company that offers a similar product in the same market and is promoted to the same customer base as another company. These two companies are in competition for the same customer base. It is very important for designers to fully understand what their competition is offering their customer in order to try to make their product more attractive in some way. So for instance, I have a specific market as a fashion designer that I am trying to market to. And I'm going to look at all the different brands and stores that are most similar to me and are basically marketing their product to the same customer base. Um, it's important to do this because you're essentially fighting over the same money. If customers go to your competition, you will directly be losing money. If you're able to convince your customer that you have some advantage over your competition, then they will come to you and you will be making more money. Um, and it is always very important for a designer to understand this because it's so very connected to their, uh, directly to their market, directly to their bottom line, um, which means the money that they're going to make, and of course, um, is it very important for a brand to maintain good customer relations. So um, shopping reports are the most common way for design companies to research what the competition is doing and how it is resonating with their customer base. Now we went over um, shopping reports last week, so I'm not going to go too deep dive into shopping reports right now, as we covered that last week. Popular media. So just like with celebrities, different types of popular media can spark trends. Customers will be influenced by the types of media they like to consume. So designers should be kept aware of the popular shows, music, games, movies, etc. that their customer enjoys. Popular media can serve as a source of trend dispersions, uh, or popular media that can serve as a source of trend dispersion include movies, shows, music, sports, video games, also viral videos and memes. And depending on which area and what to focus on will uh, depend greatly on your customer. 
if your customer tends to like movies more or a certain genre of movies more um, so specifically let's say your customer loves horror movies so you're going to specifically look at popular horror movies um, if they like sports um, what sports do they like? And this might be very geographic as well. So what sports teams do they like? So that could be based on what city or state that your customer is based in. Um, so you might have to narrow it down. Or what type of sport they like just overall. Do they like skateboarding or do they like basketball? Um, and again, this is a really specific for your customers. And not all of these things are going to be relevant to your specific customers. So you might have a customer that loves music, loves all types of music, maybe specifically um, pop music, but doesn't really like movies, doesn't really like sports. So those things are not going to be relevant. So you have to sort of identify, focus in on only the areas of media that your customer is most uh, likely to consume, most likely to also kind of be inspired by. Another source of our trend research can be on the street. So in order to get in touch with their customers, designers will go out and visit certain spots where their customers like to go. This could include certain neighborhoods, stores, restaurants, clubs, galleries, etc. People watching is a great way for designers to see firsthand what trends are being adopted by their customers. Often fashion publications will feature photos taken on the street of early adopters and their clothing. They provide an important trend resor researching resource for designers. So right now, um, if you guys feel okay, you can go out and do on the street research. And you can snap some pictures with your phones, just be discreet as many people don't like their pictures being taken some people love it and you can always ask of course and it's a really great way again to sort of put your finger on your pulse of what is happening in real time with your customers um, and what your early adopters are presenting um, to society now if you don't want to go out because it might be dangerous right now um, lots of fashion publications as I mentioned offer um, on the street photography and I, I'm going to take a little bit of a tangent right now to look at some of that examples so this is WWD and I'm going to talk about WWD a little bit later but it stands for women's wear daily and is one of the top industry publications and they typically have street style sections so here we are the very uh, fairly late um, article um, that came out September 24th just a few days ago um, about street style and on the streets of Milan probably relating to Fashion Week in Milan so let's just click on it now WD has a soft paywall which means some of their articles you will not be able to access without purchasing a subscription um, but a lot of their slideshows and um, specifically uh, their street styles are free and also their collection slideshows are free so um, now with style.com sort of being defunct um, it's a really great place to get um, uh, runway show news um, and I'm gonna actually I, I just remembered that this is one of the things that I almost forgot in trend research um, uh, to put in but uh, designers will of course look at the runway shows um, try to figure out what's happening on the runways what the top designers are doing kind of aggregate and um decipher and analyze uh what colors are being used what trends are being seen um and of course publications like this will do their own sort of wrap-ups um and uh analyzations of the trends designs colors fabrics um details uh, that were commonly seen or being uh, uh, perceived as being trending within our fashion shows. So of course this is going to be sort of a two for our street style and also what's happening with the um, you know fashion weeks around the world. So this is not the runway shows of course 
but this is what people are wearing on the street to go to the shows. So this would still um, really fall under the category of our early adopters. Um, the fashion shows themselves are sort of the innovators. That's the innovation line. These are the early adopters, the ones that are going to very, very importantly, hopefully bridge many new trends and styles over to the majority um, portion of our population. So I'm just going to click through a few. You, of course, can go to WWD and do your own research on street style. But again, they typically have, uh, and lots and lots of publications have street style sections. And it is a great way to do your street style research without having to go anywhere um, and wait a long time. Because of course, you know, if you're doing it on your own, you have to go ahead and sort of uh, sit around and wait for someone stylish to come along. Um, and here, we have already people who have aggregated um, and collected um, lots of good information and sort of visual snippets of what's going on um, and curated them straight to you. However, the disadvantage of um, relying too heavily on pub uh, industry publications for street style is you don't get any unique insights. So everyone else is getting these same insights um, they might not be tailored specifically to your customer um, and you can't make any inferences that maybe your competition or someone else um, is making um, because of course they're all the same images, everyone has access to them, everyone is taking from them. So if you're looking for a unique trend forecasting or a unique trend analyzation, it's best you do it yourself. Okay, so again, street style, um, and I'm going to put that in tandem, of course, with paying attention to our runway shows, what's going on with our fashion weeks, things like that, um, which of course you can also find really great um, sources of on WWD. Uh, they typically have um, all of the major designers, um, a slideshow of their collections at all of the major fashion weeks. Ties also into our next category, which is industry publications. So there are many newspapers, online blogs, sites, etc., that offer important insight onto, uh, into the fashion industry. Uh, designers rely on these sites to give them an understanding of different trends occurring on the industry level. Although these publications can also provide information on what is happening on the customer level as well. So a lot of times when you look, you have to pick the right publication. A lot of them or are, let's say, more macro uh, focused. So something like uh, WWD, especially New York, they have different. Um, so here's WWD New Line. Um, geographic locations, so you we might uh, particularly pick the publication for your specific location geographically. Um, or they might be a publication that focuses um, much more specifically on a niche market, um, or, which of course would be more of your micro or mainstream trends. Um, these are sort of focused on, of course, um, kind of more macro uh, publications that are a little bit more overarching, try to cover the fashion industry on a, uh, on a whole, um, and they will include WWD, so Women's Wear Daily, uh, the New York Times style section, which is in every issue, they have a style section. They also, the New York Times comes out with uh, uh, T, which is their style magazine. I believe they uh, publish it quarterly. Um, and it is um, a full magazine that uh, focuses specifically on style and fashion, things like that. Um, of course, style magazines like Vogue, um, in addition, uh, fashion bloggers and style sites. Um, are very, very popular. So let's take a look at a few of these. So we'll pop on back over to uh, the internet and take a look at some of these um, industry publications. So we looked already at WWD. Actually, let's look at the main page just so you kind of get a feel for it. 
so this is the main page and of course you know most of it is about our um, Milan Fashion Week because that's what's happening right now very important and um, you'll be able to uh, link a lot of the designers runways but they also have uh, a lot of articles about what's going on in the industry a lot of business articles um, things that will kind of discuss um, different museum uh, exhibitions um, things in technology politics or culture that are having these more macro trend effects on fashion uh, and things like that so here we are we have a lot of the latest uh, spring uh, 2021 shows from Milan that you can uh, check out we have different news trend reporting business information maybe sometimes celebrity information and you can see all the different articles and things like that now you'll be able to uh, read and have access to any article without a key so all this runway stuff is all uh, free and accessible to you I actually haven't run into most of the runway coverage and, and fashion week coverages no matter where are free um, because of course the designers themselves love the publicity but a lot of sometimes more of the um, industry articles will be locked there is a soft paywall um, but even without the subscription uh, there's plenty of information to get from the website so it's definitely worth um, a visit let's pop on over to the New York Times so this is the New York Times uh, uh, style section and specifically for fashion and uh, the New York Times is, is a lot more sort of article based um, and they'll have you know different articles about you know um, style or fashion uh, what's going on so on and so forth so it's a good part um, it's very a very good place to go for you know things like that um, what's on a sort of macro level is affecting the industry or markets or different things like that um, it also has a soft paywall so you're limited to the amount of articles that you can read in a, a certain a period of time so pick the articles you really like uh, <laughs> and read them and then you know save the rest for later or you know you can always get a subscription if you like of course but again you don't need to um, in addition to um, newspapers and magazines like this um, now we see different fashion bloggers and style sites coming into uh, the zeitgeist and having a lot of influence not only on designers but also on um, customers as well so this is an example of a style blogger who's quite popular um, and they will post images ideas so it's uh, the bloggers tend to be almost uh, you know very mood board esque very visual there's not going to be a lot of articles there's not going to be a lot of analyzing or discussion or say industry news and things like that it's just going to be very very visual um, so you're going to get these sort of little tidbits of popular trends colors things like that it's almost like advanced street watching so um, again designers will a lot of times have specific style bloggers in mind and the ones that they choose of course will be relevant to this um, what their customer likes if their customer is following this person they need to follow them too if their customer is not following them or is not interested then of course they uh, should not be paying too much attention to uh, their blog or whatever else their Instagram feed or whatever it is in addition there's a lot of style sites they're not traditional publications like magazines or things like this maybe um, uh, decades ago they would have been a magazine but now they have uh, a site and they will focus um, typically on a more micro customer base so they'll be a little bit more focused 
in what they choose to um, talk about or represent. Um, but they'll be a little bit more broad spectrum. So they'll talk a little bit lot about media, entertainment, fashion, style, lifestyle, um, kind of a more broad sep um, a spectrum of categories, but targeted to a more uh, specific customer. So this can be a really great source of trend research um, if you know, again, that your customer is looking to these style sites, um, is going to be influenced by what they say, is consuming them, is consuming these articles, uh, so on and so forth. And this is, there's many, many, this is just an example of one, and I'll just scroll through, we can see there's, you know, uh, lots of different sort of media, even like horoscopes, things like that, things are, you know, not really related to fashion, it just has a general sort of central um, focus on uh, style and fashion, but is, is all going to really kind of try to pick up on anything that would be appealing to the customer, not just um, uh, style, of course. But as we can see, we'll just sort of scroll through some of the articles. A lot of them are style and fashion related, but some of them are, you know, um, kind of lifestyle. Um, just sort of uh, interesting um, to them. Um, media and um, different things like that that would be related to the customer. News that the customer would be interesting in. So again, you can see, you know, not everything is super um, fashion specific, but all of it is sort of fashion adjacent, let's say. And, you know, of course, a lot of it is very, very uh, relevant to very specifically fashion. So this is um, just one example. There are lots and lots of different types. Maybe you have your own that you like. Um, just an example. Uh, and I'd like to conclude our sort of sources of trend research with uh, fashion industry uh, forecasters. Um, so there are many companies that specialize solely in predicting fashion trends, from popular colors to design trends. These companies offer subscriptions to fashion companies who want additional insight into trend direction. Popular industry forecasters include Fashion Snoops, Trend Tablet, WGSN, and Trend Stop, among others. There are many others, some, some free, um, but most some are, have limited content for free, um, but most will offer different levels of subscription for more information. Now, um, hopefully, um, we all have access to Fashion Snoops. So, um, a new partnership between Fashion Snoops, um, the Fashion Design Program, and the Business of Fashion Program um, has been developed, which should give access to everyone in this class um, full access to the Fashion Snoops website. Um, I was told uh, by our Fashion Snoops contact that you were emailed um, a uh, uh, emailed uh, instructions on how to gain access to the website. I hope that that is true uh, because you, of course, for your project tied to this lesson, uh, can use Fashion Snoops. And even if you don't use it, you should absolutely um, go ahead and just go through it because it's a really great um, source of what designers are looking at to help influence how they create their designs. This is their home site, and I just kind of want to go through it just a little bit, but really I want you to explore it on your own. Um, and, you know, do take advantage of it um, because I believe a fashion snoops uh, subscription if I wanted my company to have a subscription to Fashion Snoops is something like ten thousand dollars so um, please 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 take advantage of it it's you know well worth it because it's completely free for you right now and um, it's going to be a really great source for you to do your trend research and to uh, come up with your trend forecasts so this is the website um, and I just sort of want to go, um, again, very briefly over the different things that we have. 
So if I go to culture, we can see their macro trends are here. Um, we have color, cultural sentiments, opportunities, consumer insights, new and now, um, artificial intelligence trackers, points of focus, so on and so forth. So these are, again, uh, uh, we, macros it, trends are their own category, but um, a lot of these are going to be sort of fit into uh, macro categories. Um, we can look at markets, market specific coverage, la la la. Oh, I have to log in. Why am I not logged in? Sorry about that. I thought I was logged in. It has my name up here. Our Kingsborough name. try this again. Sorry, I thought I was all logged in and ready to show you. But in any case, um, well, here I am. Okay, so, <laughs> all right. Let's pop on over to our macro trends. So already we're going to 2020. So again, so um, fashion weeks are already happening for our spring 2021. So again, we look quite uh, a ways forward in fashion. So um, our macro trends are being set for uh, 2022 and sort of different aspects and different macro trends that we're seeing um, that they are identifying right now. Um, let's move to Navigation backwards is a little tricky, but let's go back to the home page. Or not, there we go. Let's look at, um, so we can do um, more specific markets. Um, so women, so we have an analysis of 2021 runway. Here are different posts. So it has street style trends here as well. Um, market trends, so this would be specifically swimmer, of course, intimates, of course, so on and so forth, more, um, different articles that will be relevant to uh, different markets, so on and so forth. Now, um, we also have trade shows, so we'll get into what trade shows are, but you can look at runways, trade shows what's happening in retail, what's happening on the street, um, uh, different things we see that are hot now. So that would be sort of our micro uh, trend um, category, things like that. Now, um, we also have in uh, Fashion Snoops, what each of you guys should be very interested. Now, it's not really related so much to this project, but they have an enormous amount of really great webinars and web series from industry professionals um, of, in lots of different markets, talking about lots of different aspects of the fashion industry. And again, these are all made free by the uh, subscription to Fashion Snoops, which of course would otherwise be very, very expensive. So um, I would take full advantage of you know looking at and participating in or just uh, con uh, watching these webinars and web series um, they're very very interesting they're very very informative um, and they're really a great source of what's going on in the fashion industry right now um, so again just take full advantage of your access to this site Please let me know if you have trouble accessing the site or you did not receive an email from Fashion Snoops um, telling you how to log on.
I was told that you all got it, but you know, sometimes these things can go awry. So um, again, this is something just like with WWD, just explore it on your own. You're going to have access to Fashion Snoops, um, I believe for the full year, um, you'll have it. So even when this class is over at the end of the semester, you should have it for about a year. Um, so take full advantage of it, um, learn what you can from it. Um, include it in, you know, uh, the, either this uh, project if you'd like, um, and use it as a resource for other collections that you might be creating, so on and so forth. So that basically concludes, you know, how we, how trends will diffuse through the population, what types of trends that we look at where we get our trend research from, and the next is to simply do our forecasting. And really what we do is we take all of this different information and we analyze it to try to predict what's going to happen in the upcoming seasons. It's rather difficult, and a lot of places do it for us so we can take information directly from forecasters uh, like Fashion Snoops or even publications, uh, take their forecasts verbatim, or from our own research, do our own analyzation, and come up with our own forecasts. And that is going to be your project tied to this lesson, and it's going to be your trend forecasting assignment, assignment number two, due next week, Monday, uh, December, I'm sorry, October 5th. So the assignment is to do your own trend research and create a trend forecast for a specific customer and market. Along with that, you're going to create a mood board based on your findings. So this is going to be done in three parts. The first part is to select a customer and market. In your report, begin by describing what market and customer you choose to do your trends research on. Include the following. What is your market? And be as uh, descriptive as possible. As I mentioned, I think maybe previously, I don't want to hear your market was high-end. Your high-end is a price point and not a very accurate or specific one at that. Um, is it high-end urban casual? Is it high-end swimwear? Um, and even with that, I, you know, um, again, be as specific as possible with your market um, description. What price point is your market? Now also describe the target customer of your market. Include their age, income, location, hobbies, likes, dislikes, traits, etc. The better you understand your market, or I'm sorry, the better you understand your customer, the better you understand your market, and the better you under, uh, can understand how different um, trending factors, whether they be micro to, uh, macro to micro, how they're going to affect your customer. Because if you don't know your customer, you don't know how they're going to react to these uh, changing things in society or how they're going to be influenced by them or what is going to be attractive to them to pick up and adopt. Next, you're going to do your research. In this next section of your report, please select three different sources from which to base your trend, resor uh, trend research. And these can be any one um, or more of the things that we just went over. So they can include um, industry publications, um, street style reports, uh, style blogs, um, what's popular in mass media, so long as it's relevant to your customer and market, um, celebrities, uh, what they're wearing, again, so long as it's relevant to your market and customer, so on and for so forth but at least three sources. If you'd like to include more, please do so. Um, in your report, include the following. What were your three sources? And also, please include links if applicable. Um, so if you used a specific um, style blogger, please um, link to their blog. If you used a specific article, please link to the article, um, so on and so forth. So based on your research, what are three macro trends that can be seen in your market currently? So in your market and also affecting your customer, of course. Um, based on your research, what are three mainstream trends that can be seen in your market currently? 
Based on your research, what are three micro trends that can be seen in your market currently? See the little progress there. Um, uh, and then based on uh, your previous three answers, how are those macro trends affecting your customer and how they dress? Um, how are the mainstream trends affecting your customer, how they dress, so on and so forth? Part three is to create a mood board. Create a mood board that will visually express a trend forecast for your customer and market. So what you're doing is you did all this research and based on that research, you're going to predict what is going to happen in your market, okay? For let's say the next season. You can jump ahead if you want. If you want to do a really, if you want to do, you know, spring 2030, go for it. But just let me know that you're doing that. Um, but otherwise, I'm just going to assume that it's going to be a um, spring 2022 board or a fall uh, 2022 board. Do pick one um, season. I know I didn't mention this on here, but do pick one season. I'll add that in here. So based on your research, of course, you're going to um, predict what's going to happen color-wise, trend-wise, um, uh, design detail-wise. Um, for your customer and market, and that's your trend forecast. Uh, you're going to create a mood board that will include a color palette, visual elements that represent trends to come, and specific examples of outfits that best illustrate your forecast. In the report section, include the following information about your mood board. So this will be in your written section as well. What part of your research allowed you to choose the color palette you did. So why did you choose your color palette? What about your research and what you were seeing made you choose the color palette you did? What about your research influenced how you created the mood board? So why do you, did you include the visual elements you did? What parts of your um, research are pointing toward these sort of aesthetic trends? What trends are you forecasting with your mood board? So what, um, again, design details, sort of aesthetic um, trends are you forecasting? And how did you select the looks you did? And why do you think they are examples of trends to come? Okay, so again, this will be a written section and your mood board in tandem. Um, and just be as specific as you can uh, with your answers um, and good luck. Hopefully this will be a fun exercise of looking into that crystal ball, uh, trying to predict what trends are going to come out for the next collections, the next seasons, things like that. It's just one of the many hats that we wear as fashion designers. Um, and again, any questions, go ahead and email me. And that concludes our lesson for today. Bye.